Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. This episode of the New Stack Makers is sponsored by Raygun. Raygun provides full stack error crash and performance monitoring for tech teams. If you're concerned you're losing customers to poor quality online experiences, Raygun provides you with the answers. Raygun surfaces errors and performance problems into a dashboard and gives you the actionable information you need to solve them before they reach your customers. Raygun has created a special offer for the Newstack listeners. Head to raygun.com forward slash TNS to get up and running and claim your free gift today. Hey, it's Alex Williams, the new stack here at Kubacon plus Cloud Native Con in China, and I'm with Priyanka Sharma. Hi, Priyanka, how are you? Hi, Alex, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm great. Well, great to have you. And now you're at GitLab now, and That's when we correct. first talked, it was at Kubernetes uh, North America 2016. And you were then at Lightstep, and we talked about developer advocacy. With uh, with Michael, who is over at Portworx now. That's correct. Still, I think he was there at the time. But I am really curious about how you got your start in tech. What what is those early roots of your kind of beginning, kind of like, you know, interested in technology overall? Were you a teenager? Were you in school? Tell us about that. I'm curious. Sure. I did not expect that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, um, let me think about this. So I have a very unconventional entry into technology, quite frankly. So I uh, grew up in India, in small town India, and we didn't have a computer or anything. There were some computer sciences courses that I took, so those were always fun. I really enjoyed those. But it, it wasn't like computers were a part of my life. That was not the case. Um, and uh, I ended up applying to colleges in the US for um, my college education. And uh, I remember as I was applying, I was really using a computer for the first time. I didn't even know how to use Microsoft Word. So it was, it was humble beginnings. Um, I ended up going to Stanford University in Palo Alto. Stanford is its own city in the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was my first um, entry point into a world that was truly embedded in technology where this, this university was the genesis of so many great companies like HP, I mean, Google, like there's so many, like I can't even like, like you, the list could just keep going on. Um, I was, however, uh, very focused on student government and so I was not, I was more into that world whereas advocacy, fighting for student rights for this thing or that thing. And it was really good fun. And I was a political science major. Uh, I really enjoyed my math courses, but for some reason, I can't quite place it. It was always, oh, student government's taking up time. I want to just focus on that. And poli sci is a sim like, straightforward major. Let me just do that. I did that. And I was expecting to go down the regular path of maybe like finance, consulting, something like that. But interestingly, in that recession, the best job that also agreed to sponsor a visa for me was at Google. And so I ended up in tech by accident, really. I had no expectations of getting into Google, just as I had had no expectations of getting into Stanford. So it all just was very positively serendipitous. Um, so I joined Google. I was working in the AdSense team. And that was all fun. I was. Um, like an account manager type person working with on very entrepreneurial people who had these online businesses that they monetized, online content businesses that they monetized with ads. Um, and Google was a great experience. But along with AdSense, the reason I really enjoyed it was I actually got to work with the engineering and product team, which also happened serendip serendipitously, uh, where I was um, part of like, um, 
representing the sales team uh, for an internal data tool and the product manager left so they're like you know you know the requirements because they're your team's requirements can you just pm this thing and get it through to the finish line and me and the engineers had a ball working together in three months we launched everything we were supposed to launch um, and it was quite a success and I just really enjoyed that experience. I always wanted to go smaller, like build my own business and so I decided to leave the hallways of Google even though I had an offer to join the engineering organization as like a program manager who did this kind of parachute and fix things. Um, and I worked at a company called Outright that got bought by GoDaddy and then subsequently GoDaddy went public. That was cool. Um, I was product marketing there. There I learned that I really enjoy community education and teaching and learning, but n I wanted to serve a different audience. Then I started doing my own startup, which was uh, a dev tool. And that just happened because I'd met a co-founder who had a kernel of an idea and we built on it together. And that was really the true beginning, I would say, of my career as it stands today. It's still very much more different because that was a simple like app dev application. Um, and now I'm in distributed systems. But that was the beginning. Made a lot of friends in the space. Ended up working for a company called Lightstep where I was able to learn about what are the distributed systems, what are the challenges people face from the best in the business really, uh, because the founders there had built a lot of the observability stack at Google. And I got involved with the open tracing project that they were championing from the beginning. And I had a front row seat to observability, the issues and the cutting edge ways to solve the problems. What happened as I went along was that I developed this empathy for the end user community, for the engineering managers, for the directors of platform, and the life that they lead really. And that served me in good stead because I love hanging out with that community. KubeCon has been one of the most receptive places for me. And uh, now I'm at GitLab and here I am back at KubeCon. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. But the liberal arts influence, how does it affect you today in your work? You know, it's very interesting. For a while I was, like, did I waste all of my undergrad years? Um, and the answer is no. So one is that I did a lot of um, classes on philosophy and like of Western thought, Eastern thought, all of that. Literature and philosophy has been great when I think about, in how I think about the world. When I look at patterns, when I look for uh, what's gonna come in the future, I think my brain works very differently from the folks I'm around, and that's an asset. The other thing that college has given me is actually the student government stuff, where it was all about advocacy. It was all about like the search for truth, a better existence, and working with people to achieve that. And honestly, that's what I do today. So it's pretty great. So the patterns, what are patterns that you're seeing today in, you know, in your approach? You're now in charge of Cloud Native Alliances at GitLab. Those patterns, those there's just certain philosophies around open source. How is that influencing your work now? Hmm. Like what are those patterns you're starting to see? What gotcha. are those patterns? Like, I mean, we talked earlier about mm -hmm. like this, like you talked in your keynote about observability, but we, were, we also were chatting just before we got yeah. on air about uh, the, the tools out there. And there's just so many of the tools out there. I'm curious about, you know, the, the patterns that you're seeing in the market that kind of mm -hmm. influence your thinking now. Absolutely. So I think with the advent of Kubernetes, we were able to ship faster, much better, and that was great for us, right? In like this was, I think two years ago is when Kubernetes really mm -hmm. came to its head, just about when I attended that first KubeCon, I think was when um, public belief in the project really happened. That led to this explosion in tooling and all of us got really busy picking the best point solution we could find and that was all well and good because we learned a lot and we've all become a lot better at operating microservices today and then now we're at a point where there are many teams uh, there are many independent teams and organizations because they're all running uh, their own services they're building and running their own services Many of those have picked up tooling that made sense to them, and suddenly we're in a tool chain crisis of sorts. And what's happening is, let's say you have 50 teams running their own stuff, that's great for that team in that silo, but when you as a 
VP of engineering look at this and the tooling that's around, it's a mess, right? The sum is not greater than the parts, but rather the other way around because there is no cohesion. The parts are actually what are com complicating? Exactly, exactly. And that's something that it's not just my observation. I've had conversations with a lot of folks and peers. I'm in fact doing a panel on the getting out of the weeds of, in, of Cloud Native in the next uh, US KubeCon. And Matt Klein is on the um, panel with me as are some end users uh, and uh, Alexis from how, Weave. How do people fall in those, we the, those weeds? I think it's very much, as I was saying, you have these small uh, cells of teams that are shipping and uh, operating their own microservices. So in that moment, whatever seems like the best tooling, you go for that. But then when you look at it from an org level, you're, what do you standardize on? There is no standard. And suddenly, you've paid the cost mm -hmm. of acquiring all these tools. That, and anybody who's worked with programmer knows how that goes. You've paid the cost of integrating these tools. And then finally, it's the most insidious cost of the context switching. So as an efficient person, even if going from a Slack alert to a Grafana dashboard takes you two seconds, when you think from the enterprise perspective, at GitLab, I, that's the people I talk to a lot lately, um, for a 6,000 developer workforce, that's a three hour loss with just one context switch. So no crisis gets solved overnight. You know, There's Agreed. no immediate solution. What are the iterative approaches to solving these problems if you are an engineer who is facing this tool crisis, so to speak? So um, I would say that this crisis uh, shows up more when people have to collaborate across teams. So that's when engineering leaders, uh, engineering engineers, leaders, et cetera, will start seeing this more and more. And the best steps are to start thinking, really. It's not acting, it's actually thinking about, okay, what have we promised? our end user, our, who's our customer, what have we promised them? So, waterfall the company's objectives down to each organization, including engineering. Figure mm. out what data you need to deliver that experience, who needs to collaborate, who needs to be like you know visible, who needs to see what's happening, and then based on that, pick a somewhat hub-like model where you have some, you have flexibility, so, Anybody who needs to, for example, deep dive on a specific set of transactions can go and instrument the, for traces, as an example. But at the same time, there's something that is unifying it, whether it's a service mesh, or it's something like GitLab, which is a single application for DevOps. Um, and that, that thing should be where it's visible what's going on across teams. You can jump in and collaborate as needed without waiting for an artificial hall handoff. And the final piece is that governance needs to be pan or organization as opposed to ad hoc. Once you have that, then you can really feel comfortable with what you're doing. So, so explain the hub concept then. Yes. Um, a hub is basically, well, definitionally the central point, right? Right. Um, and what I am suggesting people do and what we are seeing, frankly, in the GitLab customer base and generally in this, um, in these conferences is that people are starting to think, across my company, what are our objectives? What do we absolutely need to know? What, are, what do we need on the observability front? How should our CI CD pipeline run? How should it connect to um, unit tests? And should it, you know, all those little things. People are starting to think at a macro level. So when you do that, put as much of governance, as much of security, as much of workflow in a way that doesn't matter which team you're in, you're using the same thing. That's really the hub model, where you set a platform that people can use across teams. So that really then is a, an approach that an engineering manager would, ad, would adopt who works across teams. And see, then yeah. would follow through with that, and the teams then would be following those workflows to, to you know, use that hub as their core, to yes. some extent. I see what you're saying. <clears throat> so, the most natural person, natural is a loaded term, but the most like, probably least friction, uh, the, there will be the least friction when someone with a, a director of engineering or a dev tools VP, or even engineering manager type person thinks about this. But the ideal world scenario 
is that every individual, when they are thinking through the tooling that they are going to bring into their work, think from a workflow perspective. How is this going to impact their work when they have to talk to the next team? Because that will change their decision making from going for the sh snazziest object to the boring solution that works for the long term. The boring solution that works for the long term, because that gets for to the, the long term. Because <laughs> that gets to the heart of the developer experience. Yes, and it's sustainable over time. You don't want to keep buying new things. It'll like you'll waste more money than you generate, and so you don't. Nobody wants that. Which is interesting because that's kind of more of a. It's kind of like we're going full circle in a way. Yes, I, I, I see where you're coming from, but uh, with the nuance. So I do think some consolidation is necessary, but that doesn't mean you take individual needs, uh, like you know, you uh, don't look at individual needs. Once you have the right hub type model has the flexibility that you can deepen certain pieces. Does that, does that? Yeah, it does, I yeah. saw it. So, um, yeah, so let's get into the hub a little bit more. What's, what is, what, what's a healthy hub? <laughs> so again, I think, I don't think it's... It's a workflow issue more than anything. Yes. Exactly. That's really not, it's really not a hub central spoke. It's a workflow approach. And fair, it's like, fair. so, That's so fair. it starts with the business objective. Yes. Then the teams then are working according to workflows, right? They, they, they have their workflows that they use in their day-to-day -day work. Yes. Those workflows have to fit the business objective. And then do the technologies then I find their way into the workflow or... Because we talk about this a lot, I'm curious gotcha, on gotcha. your approach. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I would say the workflow should enable the business objective. Right. The workflow has to come from some kind of tooling. Right. Right. And that could one example of that would be you use a service mesh to standardize what, in the case of observability, what are going to be what's your observability stack that every service has. That's one example. And then you may decide, me as a developer may decide that I have this basic stuff covered, but the reality is I need to instrument into my service much more deeper to because it's a mission critical service for whatever reason. And so I am going to um, get distributed tracing for my set of services. Uh, okay. So I could do that mm. beyond just the top level info that the sure. tracing from the service mesh is getting me. Um, but that allows that flexibility, but at the same time there's that standardization. Great. So, we, you mentioned observability, distributed tracing, for example, and observability stack. What are the patterns you're starting to see emerge with teams and the workflows they're establishing with observability practices? Sure. I think um, last year or the year before, we were talking about just how do we solve this observability crisis. Like people were spinning up services and then they were toppling over because they didn't know what was happening. That was stage one. Stage two was we came up with some solutions. Jaeger got into the market. Lightstep, uh, a proprietary solution, got into the market. Prometheus started doing really well. Um, that was stage two. Now I think stage three is we're, this is so funny how everything comes back to the same thing of a unified experience. Because now we're thinking of what could be called the holy grail of system analysis, where you have metrics, alerts, traces, and logs. But they shouldn't exist in isolation. You need to have a workflow. Again, we go back to workflows at all times that connects. When you get a first, you need to codify your alerts. Sorry, let me back up. First, you need to monitor the right things. So set the right metrics, and this will come if you have figured out what's your business objective and your team's SLO. Um, first, monitor the right things. Then codify the alert states so that the right thing sets off an alert. Right. Once you know what your P99s are, what your P95s are, what your error budget is, you have all that done. But then when you get an alert, ideally, it connects you to, it takes you to an example trace of where the problem's occurring, as opposed to you then switching to a system yourself, and you know what I mean? Because what will normally happen is you'll have your, um, your, your buzzer will ring, and you will probably jump into the logs directly. That's what really ends up happening. And that's the worst case scenario from a productivity perspective. What's ideal is you get an alert, it has example traces, you go to the trace where it connects you if needed. You can go look into the logs in the specific space that the problem is as opposed to just swimming through them. So that again, it's all about workflows now. Um, and this consolidation into a holy grail is what I think the industry is working towards in general. Every vendor or open source project I talk to talks about it. What's GitLab's journey? 
So GitLab is a very interesting company. Um, as I mentioned, we are a single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. The entire DevOps lifecycle is actually very broad. It starts with when you're planning the issues, when you're deciding what is going to be built, you're creating stories. Then you go build things and like put, put the code in version control. Then you like, then you kick off your CI CD pipelines and then push the code off uh, with unit tests and this and that, and then you have review apps, uh, security is all baked in, and eventually you uh, deploy maybe to a Kubernetes cluster on a, any cloud. And then there's monitoring beyond that. So that's how we really look at the DevOps lifecycle right now. It's very broad if you think about it, and it truly covers the whole spectrum. And it goes back to what I was saying. When you think from a workflows perspective, you will put things together as opposed to separately, and then the sum will be greater than the parts. So, uh, so when GitLab is thinking through its own application development and its own application development at scale, yeah. what are some of the patterns that it's learning that is affecting, that is influencing its own deployments? Totally, so we, we eat our own dog food all the time and GitLab itself is a very interesting example of an application from a cloud native perspective because we were built and we have millions and millions of users and we were initially a Ruby monolith. And now we've like broken it down to having some services and also retaining some of some parts more monolithic. And uh, we, I actually don't want to like totally talk too much about it because we have two talks related to this topic uh, at KubeCon US coming up. So we'll deep dive there, but we've approached it very thoughtfully. And what we've learned in this process is again, gosh, I, I feel like a broken record. It really is about making sure that cross teams, people know what projects are work, being worked on and what the progress is. So there's visibility, cross team, and then people can jump in and collaborate without having to wait for an artificial handoff. And that's something that works really well for us. And it beyond engineering, by the way. So GitLab really eats its own dog food. So I, for example, work in issues where, let's say, for example, I am, uh, so I'm working on the serverless functionality that we have, for example. And so I see exactly the progress that's being made because everything is updated in the issues and what's, uh, what's the plan for the next release. And because when I see that, I can decide that, okay, I'm going to write a blog post about it. I create an issue about it, finish that, um, send it off to the folks who'd built, who've built the feature as take a look, put your feedback in, and then we'll send it off to content to review and then we'll get it published. So we all work together in this way and I don't have to wait for them to call me and tell me what's going on. They don't need to like, let me know that it's time to start working on a blog. You know what I mean? It's very like concurrent and that's our sort of mission. And then the governance aspect is just that whatever I can access in GitLab is like, I don't need to worry about should I be doing this or not. It's all, the governance is set at a top level so nobody has to care about all that. I am intrigued. I uh, we would look forward to the the discussion uh, at Kubicon on this topic. It's one that's really of interest to us. Yes. What what is the story then going forward for you know for for your for you and GitLab into 2019? Sure. So um, it's a broad question, but I think in the context of what we're talking about and the patterns and establishing the patterns, I expect that continuous delivery is going to be a continued kind of focus and emphasis then? Absolutely, so along with version control, GitLab CI has been our big flagship product. It's uh, rated number one by Forrester, for example, and we're seeing a lot of usage <clears throat> with people just on their own coming in and wanting to use it more and more. It just does really well. It's very well suited, particularly for cloud native. Um, and we're going to keep expanding what we've done already. So we have established ourselves in version control planning, version control, and um, CI, CD. Now we need to expand that to all the other aspects of the software development lifecycle that we do touch upon. Registries is an example. We already have Prometheus baked in and Jaeger is coming in, but we need to up-level the observability story. And we're working on that because we're such a iterative company. Every month, each release changes things by a lot. So it's very fast moving. Um, and 2019 will really, I think, be our year of expansion with more and more companies and customers buying into the vision. I'm actually really 
impressed by just how well timed everything's been. We've always been saying a single application is the way to go. And we met with a lot of um, incredulity when people were like, yay, point solutions. And now, suddenly everyone's saying what we were saying all along, that, oh wait, this is a mess when you have 50 solutions. So I think things are lining and it's gonna be a next really big year for us 2019. The patterns prove themselves, right? right? No longer incredulous. No longer incredulous. Thank you so much, Priyanka, for taking some time to talk with us. The, the best of success to you and your, your journey and GitLab too. So thank you for Thank joining. you so much. This episode of the New Stack Makers is sponsored by Raygun. Raygun provides full stack error crash and performance monitoring for tech teams. If you're concerned you're losing customers to poor quality online experiences, Raygun provides you with the answers. Raygun surfaces errors and performance problems into a dashboard that gives you the actionable information you need to solve them before they reach your customers. Raygun has created a special offer for the Newstack listeners. Head to raygun.com forward slash TNS to get up and running and claim your free gift today. Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Makers at thenewstack.io slash podcast. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.